Okay, so I guess let's start with what is an IPART? Uh, some of you, or probably most of you, may be familiar with what an IPART is. Uh, but an IPART is, simply put, a family of similar parts. Uh, for example, maybe channels, extrusions, uh, nuts or bolts, where the dimensions are similar. Or the dimensions may be the same throughout your family, but the material and color could be different. Or maybe it's a combination of dimensions, materials, and colors. Uh, basically, just a family of similar parts, right? And there are basically two types of IPARTs standard and custom i parts so the standard and i part basically consists of what we call the master file and a factory uh, the master file which is also the factory file and its members the members are generated from the factory file and again it's uh, the similar parts that are within the the factory there and one reason that you may want to consider using iParts is file management. Uh, the file management is basically done from just the one file, uh, the factory file. And the main differences between a, a key difference, I guess, between a standard iPart and a custom iPart is that when a standard I part is placed in a assembly, the members are selected from a set or a fixed table. There's a finite number of members uh, predetermined. And the factory is just basically kept in the root folder and the members are kept in a subfolder. And you can see my little example, uh, the name convention, what would happen to the factory and the members would be stored in this folder here. Uh, the custom I part, the members are created on the fly when it's placed in the assembly. And here you have potential for an infinite number of members. And unlike the standard I part where you're selecting members from a table and they're stored in a subfolder, the members of a custom I part can be saved anywhere in your project folder. Uh, the user can basically browse to where they uh, want to save it. And that's my quick slideshow for now. Let's jump to Inventor. And we'll, I'll create some of these I parts on the fly here, just so you can see how kind of easy it is. So I'm just going to start a sketch. I'm in a new part. Oops, we don't need that. And for this example, just make a quick little rectangle. Uh, let me dimension this. And what I'm going to use is call this, let's call this length for now. Call it length five. And we'll call this width of four. You'll see why I'm adding. Whoops. Uh, you'll see why I'm adding a name, a value to the parameter in a second here. Um, finish that, and I'm going to extrude it out. And for the thickness, let's just say thick equals, I don't know, two for now. So when you rename your parameters, let me just say this. When you rename your parameters like that, when you create your R part, when you create your I part from the manage tab up here, those values are added to this table. So now this is the I part authoring dialog box. And you can see the values I renamed are added right to my table here. And to create your family of parts, what you want to do is right click here and insert row. And now I can have four variations. So let's start with the table here. And I can put in different values right away into the table. I'm just going to put some arbitrary numbers in here. Let's go four, six, eight, ten, and two, three, four, five. 
let's start with that. After you change your table or you create the table, you want to hit this verify button here. And if there are any errors in the table or something that inventor cannot calculate, they will come up in red. So if I go something like X here, I type in a wrong unit of measure. You can see the value, uh, you can see the box turning yellow there. So I'm going to say OK. And you'll see quickly on the left here that Inventor has created these different uh, rows here in the table portion. And if you click on the different members, you can see the box changing uh, right here. Okay, so let's go back to the table. Oh, one more thing you want to do is after, so I discussed earlier about the, the, the factory and its members. These are the members. A good habit to get into is to select your members, right click, and we need to generate the file. So if we go to that folder, just to show you, there is my part that I saved. And once I generate the members, Okay, you can see it creates a folder, and inside are those members that I discussed earlier in the slideshow. Let's go back to the table. So getting back to the table here, you can see the different tabs that we have here, right? We have the parameters, and basically that's just changing the size of your model. We also have the eye properties. So for each one of these rows, I could maybe add, if I want to add a column to my table, I would just click on the maybe the eye property. And you can see it'll add the row here. And for each one of these now, I could have a separate and unique description for each one of my eye parts. We'll go seven by eight by four. 8 by 10 by 5. Okay, let's go back and look. So if we look at the I properties for part 4, right, there's the 8 by 10 by 5. And if we go to the second one in the family, the description is different, right? So pretty easy to manage all those. Um, at this point, let me add something to this sketch so we can talk about uh, suppressing features. So I'm just going to add a little boss here, right? Now let's make it one, and we'll just extrude that out. Two is good. Let me save it so we don't lose it. I'm going to right click to go back into the table. And these are, uh, this is the new feature I added. And if I want to change the diameter, I know it's D4, and uh, length of the height of the extrusion is two inches right now. So again, if I want to add those values to my table, I can click here. And now I could change the value of that boss. And going back into the table, we can also suppress features. So that's when we come to this tab. So I'm going to add extrusion 2. And you can see it says compute. So this is a binary D suppression. So we can even, even add ones and zeros here. So 1, 0, or, oops, I didn't get off here, or we can put suppress. I'm going to verify. You can see the table is good. If I put an X here again, so you can see the binary works. So zero is suppress, one is compute. So let's see if that works. You can see in the second family, second member in our family, it's already suppressed. All right? So that's pretty cool. Let's go back to the table one more time.
we can also add in the eye properties the material. So maybe this is Illum 6061, maybe the other one's 5052. But one thing to note is the material has to be exactly as you see here. All right, so here's copper, copper, comma, space alloy. That's how it should be entered into the table. So on this last one, we can go copper, comma, space alloy, verify. You can see if I take the space out, it's not going to work. So be aware of that. So if we go back to the last part, you can see it's copper now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the other thing I want to discuss real quick, I don't want to get too deep into this, is editing via spreadsheet. So if you right click on here, you can see we have edit table, which is what I've been using up to this point. Now we're going to go into edit via spreadsheet. Okay. And that table is now added to uh, the Excel spreadsheet. So one thing you can do here, we can say something like this now. So maybe we want to make this column intelligent, right? So we can do something like this. Um, I'm not an Excel expert by any means, but I know a few things. So if we go if, and our test is going to be maybe the length column. If the length is greater than, let's say, seven, we want this value to be one or zero. So what I'm trying to do here is if the length is greater than seven, I want this to return a one. If it's less than seven, it's going to return a zero because I want that to drive my suppression here. So you can see it's returning a value of one, and then I'm going to have this value equal to this cell here. Okay, and let me just go one, two, three, four. So now this is going to C3, it's looking at. This is looking at C4 and C5. And I'm gonna uh, take this and drag it down. Okay, now you can see if I change, wait a second, it's not, something's wrong here. If it's greater than seven, it should be one. Why is this? This is not greater than seven. This should be returning a zero here. Oh, and I did it the other way around, okay. Maybe less than seven, did I do it? Okay, there we go that one anyway again i'm not an excel expert there's probably some of you who are that are better than uh, me at this so let's put four it's not updating a16 well anyway you could see what i'm trying to get at and again this can be done in ilogic okay you can do this put the same logic here that i'm doing you can put it in ilogic as well or, again, I'm a little more comfortable with Excel, uh, maybe not today, but normally I'm a little more comfortable with Excel, and I promise you this was working in my test session. Uh, oh, I know why. So, I know why. I just remembered. So, when the value is left justified, I believe it sees it as a text. And if we go to the right... It has to be a number. Ah. There we go. It has to convert to number. I thought I just did that, though. Okay, now it's working. All right, so if we change this to 8, there we go. It should update. So that's what it was. It was just a justification, and it was basically Excel was seeing this as text, but you can see how having some rules inside a spreadsheet or some logic inside a spreadsheet can drive that last column there. So I'm going to save this. We can close it 
and we can go back to the inventor ipart table and now it's just asking do i want to update this i'm going to say yes so i can see the question then just answer how big can families be uh yeah there are no there is no real limit uh to the size of a family so good question and if we look at the table now you can see this column is now uh this like brick red or what have you and because that's letting you know that excel is driving this now it sees that there's a formula there okay um another thing that actually let me go back in here one thing that you'll notice in the i part here is there are a lot of things we can control right we can control threads that's on a whole separate tab altogether one thing that's not in here is something like uh, color and i know it, it's called appearance but let's say you didn't know how to add a certain column or uh, dip another way to manage your i family or i part would be going to this manage tab and we have what's called edit factory scope and edit a member scope so what this basically means is when you're on factory scope any changes you make to the model will affect every member in the table so if i go to edit factory scope and i start a new sketch and i add a new feature here and let's make this say through all this time okay i just did edit factory scope on the model and if you go back to the table nothing has been added because the table you the only columns you want in your table are going to be the deltas right the things that's going to be variable within your model now since this extrusion 3 is the same throughout all my members there is nothing to add however if i go back here again i go edit member scope and i want the third member to have this suppressed as well um we're suppressed now if i go back to the table you'll see that the extrusion 3 the feature has been added automatically for me and it's been suppressed in the one edit member scope i was doing but the others are still computing so even if you didn't know how to edit the table in which a variable is driving the the model you can use this edit member scope to edit your model All right so even if i come in here and i add something else here a boss on that side All right and then let me sketch here again and remember i'm only on edit member scope so the only member that should be changing right now right i'm still on member scope yeah is part three and you can see i just added two more features and if we go back to the table right those have been added for me automatically here now one thing i was saying earlier that i kind of got sidetracked on is the color and if you don't know it's it the the column you want to add is called appearance but let's say you didn't know or you're a bad speller and you didn't know how to spell appearance what we could do is go to edit member scope and we could change the color for each one of these, right? So I'm gonna change blue for part three, for part four, we can change it to, I don't know, maybe red. Part one, we can change to canary yellow. And then again, if we go back to the table, you'll see the appearance column has been added along with my changes there. And of course, you could type these in manually, uh, but you know if you leave a space out or you put too many spaces, the, you're going to get the uh, error here, right? You'll get the verify, and the column will be yellow. So one little trick I just do want to show you here is I said earlier the members folder. Let me bring this over. This members folder is based on the name of the uh, of the factory. 
So one little trick you can do here is we could change this to, let's say, let's call it I part XX. The file name hasn't changed, right? The file name is still called I part. Let me do a save. And I am going to generate the members again. Generate the files. Now we should see that the members go into this folder called XX now. So if you want to rename it, you can. Uh, I see another question there. Why I parts VS Content Center? Also, all are all members of the family in my assembly, and if so, their performance impact or file size. The not all the members are technically. It'll just be the one, right? But you will have access to the factory to change out the members. Oh, why well, parts versus content center? I see. Well, I parts would be something that's not in the content center, right? If it's in a content center, then you may not need to create an I part. So uh, you may have a custom extrusion or something like that again that's not in the content center or something like this, right? Wouldn't be in the content center. So you'd have to create your own kind of I part family here. So I hope that answered your question, Boeing. All right, so now I'd like to talk about a custom I part. Oh, let me go place that in assembly and just show you what that looks like. So I start a new assembly. We just go place. And you can, if you want, go right to the member, but it's probably best practice to use the family. So you could always change members in the table. And I'll show you this later when we uh, talk about I assemblies. How does updating I part name compare to a save as? So when you do a save as, you're saving, remember we're working on the, the factory, you'd be saving as the factory. And if you save as and you generate, I believe the the new, so when you do a save as, you're creating a new part. So when you generate members with the save as, the folder will rename to the file name, right? It'll be like a separate file altogether. So let me place the, I hope that answer your question, Mitch. So let me go back to placing this I part and see what it looks like in, in the assembly environment. So here is what the I part table would look like when you bring in the, the factory. We can go to the tree or the table to place our part. You can see in the background, there's our part and as we select the different members, you can see it changing dynamically in the background. Or you can select from the table as well. So you select your part, right? You can place, and you can place again on a different member if you'd like. So it's pretty simple to place your I parts in a not much different than a regular part, right? You have this nice little table. And this is what I meant earlier about a standard versus custom. The custom is, it looks very similar to this, but it, it's still a little different, right? Uh, the, the standard I part, again, is you're placing the members from a fixed table. So let's go create a new custom I part now. For this one, it's well, already at 9.30, okay. And just going to do, let's say, an extrusion here. Say of two inches. Let's extrude it out. Now, again, this would be a case where the profile of this is actually we could change. We'll change the profile where the cut lengths, right? In your company, maybe you buy an extrusion and the cut lengths are infinite cut lengths, right? It could be anywhere from, you know, typically extrusions come from anywhere up to, they come, I'm sorry, their extrusion are usually sold in 12 foot increments. So you, your company may cut any size up to 144 inches, but you don't want to create a part number for every single one. So let's just leave that at one inch for now. Uh, let me save this and we'll call this custom high part. We can go quickly into the table. 
uh, quick to create the table rather. And the dimension I do want to bring in is the extrusion length or thickness. And since this is going to be custom, I don't, I'm not going to add any more members. I will in a second to show you. But what we want is this column to be a custom parameter column. And you can see once I do that, we have access to a specific range or specific increment. So let me go to specific range. And by default, it goes to uh, negative infinity to positive infinity. But we definitely want to put values in. So uh, the minimum cut we're going to do is, I don't know, let's say four inches. And the maximum is going to be 144. Right? Again, 12 foot is usually the length, maximum length that the extrusions are sold in. We can even, if you've noticed, we can specify increments. So the increments can be one inch, quarter inch, whatever you whatever you see fit for your company. Um, let's just say half inch. And we'll say okay. We're gonna save it. Let's go back to the assembly. And I'm gonna place that customized part. Once we do, we can type in our own value here. Now you can see if I hover, it says out of range because the minimum was what I say two or four. And we can use the arrows here to change the increment. Or we can just type in a value. If I type in a value, let's say like 5.6, it's going to round down. So it's going to round up or down to the nearest half inch because we chose half inch increments in our I part earlier. And then we can also decide by browsing here where we want to put this I part. I'm just going to put it in this folder for now. And I can place it. So. This one thing I don't like is I can't figure out how to get back into this table without dismissing and placing again. I wish you could place multiple members. So I'm going to go place that again. And just to show you, uh, we can go to 145. You see it's going to round down. Uh, I'm surprised it didn't go to 144. Interesting. It really should be 144. Ah, uh, I think because the maximum is not greater than or equal to, it's uh, less than or equal to it's just less than that's why so we have to change that value and then we could just type it in or drop it and the reason it rounded down is if we go back to the table we look at our increment oh i'm sorry no we look at our range it's this really should be 145 or 144.5 probably and then we get the 144 is what we want to do there. We can also make a combination of a standard, quote unquote, standard and custom I part. So maybe in this custom I part, we also want to have two different diameters controlled with this, within uh, this one uh, I part family. So when we say, OK, when we go back to the assembly, so I just added a one inch to the table and a two inch is what the I part has. So when I place this, when I look at the table, I can add the one inch or the two inch diameter with the custom length. Okay, you can see here. We can also select here as well, and we can type in our value. Say yes. Okay, and there's our another value. Or our second I part there. Okay. Um, I think that's all I had for I parts. I think I want to jump over to I assemblies now. Uh, let me just look at my notes. Yeah, let's go back to the PowerPoint real quick. <clears throat> so I want to talk about I assemblies next. And like I parts, I assemblies are, are what we've seen in I parts is very similar in I assemblies. Again, the only difference is instead of family of similar parts, we're talking about a family of similar assemblies. And again, still managed from the factory or the master file, and the members are generated from the factory file. And unlike an I part, 
the members in an I assembly are standard, meaning they can only be driven from the table. You can add rows, but you can't do a custom. You can't create an I assembly on the fly, so to speak. All right. So let's talk about the two different methods for creating an I assembly. So the first method is if you know ahead of time that your assembly will be an I assembly. And these are the steps that you'd want to take. Um, so the easiest thing to do is probably create some kind of spreadsheet for yourself to see what all the different variations. Create a table with the different variations that you want in your assembly. Then you can, <coughs> excuse me, then you can create your parts and I parts based on that table. You then want to start a new assembly with the parts and I parts. Uh, pick, pick a variation from the table and you want to create an assembly from that. And again, these steps are very are probably oversimplified, but hopefully you get the understanding here. Uh, then you create the I assembly table. You would definitely want to check all the variations or all the members. Don't forget to and then you want to generate the members. And one thing to note is this I assembly can be used in another assembly or in another I assembly. Right? So this maybe technically should be called an I sub assembly at that point. So that's the first method. The second method would be if you have a regular assembly and then now you decide, oh, you know, we're making so many of these uh, assemblies that let's turn this into uh, an, an I assembly, right? So again, you still want to create a table of the different variations. Now you want to change or create your I parts, right? At this point, you're probably taking your regular parts and converting them to I parts. Then what you'll have to do at that point is you'll have to edit the assembly. And this, this I'm going to demonstrate. This is the demo that we'll be doing. You'll have to go back into the assembly and you'll have to component replace. And you'll have to replace your standard part with an I part. You'll have to fix maybe any broken constraints. You'll still create the table, check the variations, check all the members generate the members and then again you can be this can now be used in your assembly so for the purpose of the demo i just created a simple uh, a smartphone uh you guys may have heard of it some of you may even own one but uh, for our example here our smartphone is, is just going to contain three parts right we're going to have a cover a glass screen and a camera and you can see the little cutout in the green one here where the camera would go so this is a table i'll be using for our demo okay all right so let's get out of this let's go back to inventor um let me move this over and let me see let me bring the table up real quick so we can all see what i'm working from uh, okay here is a table i'll be using let me put that off to the side so you can see where I'm coming from. So we have another question. What, um, let me see. What is, the best, what is the best method to create a special assembly from an I assembly? Typically, we save the factory as a special and delete the suppressed items. Not sure if I fully understand the question, but... I don't if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly. I think that's the only option, right? Um, you create the table and you suppress the ones you don't want, or I don't know if you want to delete the items, but I think you definitely want to suppress them if they're not used in some of the members. And I'll show that here. Hopefully, after this demonstration, uh, Doug, this will answer your question. How much time do we have? Nine thirty-six. Okay, we still have time. So I'm going to open the smartphone that I have. And again, this is a regular assembly that we want to turn into an I assembly. And you can see the three parts here. That's my fictitious camera. That's the uh, aluminum case. And we have a glass screen here. Hard to see but uh, because I turned the material into glass. But I promise you there is a glass screen there. So let me bring. So here's the table. Let me see if I can leave it so it's always on the screen here. 
Let's try to move it down here and maybe size this a little bit. All right, that's good. Okay, so I'm going to edit all three parts according to this table, right? So you definitely want to have, when you make an eye assembly, uh, probably best to have the a table or some kind of at least general uh, layout or the members that you want to create. So let's start with the aluminum case. I'm going to open it. And I'm just going to quickly jump over to creating an eye part table. Okay, and we want to add what the length, the width for this. And I'm going to right click, create the members. We have three variations. So we have 6.5, 6.25, and 6. We have 3 for the first one, 2.875 for the second one, and 2.875 for the third one. Okay. Uh, the cutout, oh, we have to do the cutout. Let me do that as well. So the cutout is that right there so the extrusion two so basically for the camera cutout for phones one and two we want the cutout for phone three we want to suppress it right because phone three is the no frills version with no camera so we can just suppress that feature let's go back into the table here and again for suppression we come to this tab and I'm just going to type in a zero to suppress we're going to verify. That's good. And we will save. And I'm going to generate the members. Actually, we should test first, right? Let's make sure that it looks good. Okay, that's, that looks good so far. And I'm going to generate the files. Okay, so that's one part. Let's go back to the smartphone and let's change the glass screen now. So the glass screen, we need three members as well. We got to change the color. I almost forgot. We'll come back to that in a second. So again, we have 6.5, 6.25. And if you really want it, it's not within... Uh, the context of this webinar but you could really connect these dimensions to a spreadsheet or you could link the two models together so that these dimensions are equal because these are the glass screen dimension of the length and width are the same in the uh, the aluminum case and in the glass screen so if you want to go a step further we could definitely link these dimensions together if that's maybe what you're thinking Okay, and the camera cutout doesn't matter for the for the glass screen, obviously. We'll see, but we will go back to the aluminum case here. And I forgot to add the, the colors, right? So for this, again, I think colors is easy if I go member scope. And for the third, because I'm already on the third, we're going to change the third one to red. Make sure we're in the second member. The second member is going to be blue just picking any arbitrary blue there and the first one is going to be black let's save that and let's see how they look okay that looks good so far and because I changed the members anytime you change the table uh, it's good practice to generate the file again okay so the case is done, the screen is done. Let's go to the camera because the camera size isn't going to change, but the colors, right? We want the color of the camera to match the casing. I think we lost the constraint or something's going on there. We'll take a look. Oh, yeah, we did lose the constraints. Um, what am I doing? Oh, I'm going open and we're going to create the eye part for this. We'll add, so for this camera, we only need two, uh, actually we do need three variations, I'm sorry. And again, for me, the color is easier with the member scope. 
So for the first one, the camera is black. I'm going to save it. The second one is going to be blue. And the third one will be red. We'll save that again. Let's verify. Looks good. Generate the files. Actually, the glass screen, I didn't generate the files, I don't think, so let's go back to that. I see another question coming in. Can I generate the table of parts if you if I do not have them checked out of vault? Can I generate the table of parts? So you need to check out it. it uh, no, I guess you you are changing, so you need to check out the the factory, right? Because you are making changes to the factory table. But you won't have to check out the, the members within the factory. Okay, so getting back, hope that answered your question, Bowen. Let's go back to here. And just one thing I want to show you. I'm going to update real quick. Okay, I have constraint errors here, I think. Yeah, I have some constraint errors. But don't worry about constraint. If we have time, I'll come back and fix it. Um, I'm just more worried about getting to the I part table here, or I assembly table. So let's go back here. We're going to create the I assembly now and just want to show you something. So when we do, when you do this, there is a specific property, I guess, or parameter I'm looking for here, and it's not here. It's called table replace. And because the part, it, the parts I'm using is an I part now, but originally it was a part, a regular part. So there is in a uh, table replace. I'm looking for another way to replace the parts. That'll make more sense in a minute. And that's what I was saying earlier in my PowerPoint where, right, when you edit the assembly, you're going to have to use this. You're going to have to do this because you're going to have to come and replace it with the iPart factory. And you'll see what happens to the table when I do that. All right, so I'm going to take each one of these. And I'm going to say component replace. I'm going to replace it now with the same. It's still technically the same part, but I need to have the table. And I'm going to create, make sure I select the first version for all three of these. I know we have errors. Component replace again for the camera. And I want to select the black one. So we're consistent. And same for the screen, component replace. We'll do that and make sure we're on the first member. Okay. Now if I go back into the table, or it's create the table rather, we have this right here, the table replace. We're going to add that. And we're going to add our different members here. So we want to do a table replace for the cat for the aluminum case, table replace for the camera, and a table replace for the screen. So for the smartphone one, we're going to do because the name convention is pretty simple. We, just, we can just use one. But you'll see now, if I go into this cell here, I have a pull down that shows me all the different I part members that I had just created. Okay, so for case two, for smartphone two, I'm going to pick case two, camera two, and glass screen two. And then for three, we'll go three, 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 obviously. And we'll say, okay, I'm going to verify. So can the assembly be used in Revit environment? So I, at this time, I don't think Invent. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't think Revit can bring in native Inventor files. So to answer your question, yes, but you're gonna have to do like a step translation. I believe Revit can accept, or we can maybe, I believe, turn this into a some BIM content where we can turn it into a, maybe a family. I think that's the term. Yes. Yeah. That's a Dan. Yes, you can you can uh, turn it into a family, 
but it won't have like the same functionalities as Inventor. In other words, being able to change like parameters because it becomes a dumbed down step file. That it used to be known as a sort of dem simplify. So you're simplifying the model in terms that Revit can understand because Revit does not understand what's a chamfer, what's a fillet. There's certain features that are used to create the model at the part level or at the assembly level that that Revit doesn't understand. So you simplify the model into a quote dumbed down uh, step file or a family file, and Revit can actually interact with that family file. So you are correct, Bon. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe we could a whole webinar. Could probably do a whole webinar from Inventor to Revit. But basically, the way Revit handles files is kind of different than Inventor. Revit doesn't really like holes, basically, right? Uh, Inventor can handle maybe a thousand holes, and I think that would just bog down Revit. But again, that's for a different conversation. But to answer your question, the simple answer is yes. The assembly can be used in a Revit environment. Okay. So getting back. Uh, we just created a table in a different members, so let's see if they work now. Right? Ignore the constraints now for now, just for time's sake. And you can see I have created, oh, we forgot something there, right? In our third member, we still have the camera. Right? This first smartphone needs it. The second smartphone needs it. The colors and everything look good. But the third smartphone does not need the camera, so we need to go back into the table. And for this, we use exclusion. In the feature, it was called suppress. The old days, when there were, uh, oh my God, what, what? I can't think of it now. They just changed it this year. It used to be called suppression, now it's called exclusion. Um, but we can take the component of the clock, I'm sorry, the camera, and instead of compute and suppress, now it's in the assembly, it's, it used to be called suppress. Now it's include, and actually maybe always an include, exclude. Oh, uh, we're gonna exclude in the third smartphone. I know. So let's go back. Did I exclude the camera? Ooh, why didn't it ex accept it? A little weird. Let's try that again. We'll say exclude. I don't know why it didn't stick. Let's verify. Say okay. There we go. Wait, why does it keep coming back? Is it because of the errors? Interesting. Let me get rid of the errors, see if that's affecting it. It's not adding to the table, strangely. Try exclude again. Verify and okay. Yeah, the errors. Hmm. In my practice session, the the errors were not affecting the assembly. But now you can see the table is working properly now. Kind of matches. Again, other than the constraints, the smartphone is behaving kind of the way we want. All right. Any questions? Uh, that's pretty much all I had for I parts on iAssembly. So hopefully uh, you've seen maybe some reasons to maybe turn your I parts or your regular parts or regular assemblies into an I assembly. And um, hopefully you see some of the benefits and maybe you'll start using them. Any last minute questions? Uh, Dan, would you like to add anything that I may have left an out or forgotten? Still muted, Dan. I don't know if you want to add anything or not. <clears throat> Hi, this is Dan. Um, yeah, uh, the only thing I'd like to add is, you know, the terminologies, uh, or I guess a, a better clarification is the terminologies, factory versus, you know, members and things like that. If you think of a context of like a uh, a, a car, for example, so a car would be considered like the factory, and then you have the motor. Well, that's a member of that larger factory. Now you could have sub I assemblies that. Vaughn was talking about earlier, which, well, the motor is a sub I assembly of that, and that could have the alternator, the water pump. And so different components of those uh, individual sub assemblies, um, sometimes you have variations. So if we take an example as an alternator, for example, it's a different variation that gets added to different assemblies. 
And that would be an example of how you might use an I, I assembly as well. Um, and then there are times where, you know, because of the variations of within that factory or that alternator, you know, the sizes of the armature, the sizes of the core, you know, those are different things that could be changed in terms of maybe uh, additional I assemblies or even I part, you know, when you think about bearings, you know, maybe somebody modeled it as a simple, you know, ring and an extru uh, cylinder uh, extrusion, and they just have different sizes, you know, all of that could be kind of, you know, tied into this I parts and an assembly. Um, the other thing is, you know, as Bob was going through the example, you know, one of the things that um, you have to think about in advance is, okay, naming your parameters, you know, do I have to name every parameter that's listed there? And no, the the thing that you would rename are the ones that are important, the drivers of these changes that you're trying to uh, include as part of an I part or an I assembly. Um, so, you know, and then there's that, you know, that other part of the equation is the investment in time and creating this, you know, does every single model that we have benefit from this to a certain degree, right? So if you have like, you know, changes in part, you know, it's kind of nice to be able to pick from another, uh, you know, member of an eye assembly and automatically spits it out. But the time that it takes to ramp up or to build up that assembly, you know, that might be more uh, along the lines of, okay, these are standard things that we use over and over in our company's design practices. Um, you know, same thing with eye part. Um, you know, earlier somebody was asking about I parts versus content center. Content center at its core basic is an I part, but the difference in an I part is that you're customizing it, whereas content center is something that it's an I part that was generated by Autodesk for your use, but they're all read only. So you can't really modify that unless you made a copy of that and brought it into your own library. Whereas an I part, it can be published as it an I into a content center if you choose to do so. But if you notice with the presentation today, Bond's uh, approach of use, managing these files, they're actually managed at a, you know, when he was regenerating each of the members, they're managed at a uh, file level so that you can just insert them in as other components, if you will, or I parts into other assemblies as opposed to going through content center. So, you know, because Content Center requires a little bit more of, you have to publish these I parts into the library and there's, there's a whole nother step in, in terms of handling or managing I parts in that way. So that's pretty much what I wanted to add, if that makes sense, Bon. Yeah, so um, one thing I did forget to show is, is inserting the smartphone. I just want to show that table now, if I insert into an assembly, right? Again, we have a similar table. And we can pick those different members um, to place into our assembly here. So the table looks very much the same, so not much different there than uh, an iPart. Okay, so we have <clears throat> uh, Rich Silvers asks, I assembly versus I logic. I logic, uh, you can do everything that we've seen here in I logic, but you need to know how to code, right? I assembly, you don't need to know how to code. I think that's the main. Benefit. And again, it's I assembly versus I logic versus spreadsheet. All this can be driven from your spreadsheet and not even be, you know, uh, you can forego I parts altogether. Right? You can have each member, so to speak, attached to its own separate spreadsheet and you can drive it that way. So it's just what you're comfortable with and what, you know, your strengths are. Right? I'm not sure if I could do this in I logic myself. But I assembly is easier. I may have a better chance in Excel, quite honestly. Uh, next question, Bert asked, does a custom I part create child files? Uh, yes, it does. Um, again, when you place the custom I <clears throat> the custom I part, right, when you place it in the assembly, you have the option of where to save, right? You browse. So this is where it's creating the, the child's. Uh, why do model states not work with iParts and iAssemblies? We use level of detail assembly in the past, but yeah, the level of details uh, is, yeah, 
I, I don't know if that's more of a statement or not, but uh, I, I guess they haven't added it. That's a good point. I've actually tried model states in. I don't know if there's anything in there. So what we can do the same thing is try member scope and see that way, right? We're kind of running short on time here. Um, but you may want to try the member scope and edit that way. <clears throat> Change your model states and see what happens. That'd be interesting to see. Yeah, unfortunately, I got rid of suppression now. And you should be able to suppress in here, but now it's include and exclude. Very similar, but still a little different. All right. Um. Usually, okay. Next question. Rich Silver's asked file sizes. What gets too large to manage. Uh, so file size. So I, I think maybe you're asking what lags inventor, and then sometimes it's not necessarily the file size. It's how you can model a part. So I'll give you an example. If you nest arrays and mirrors, so if you array within an array within an array, that will definitely bog down the computer. That's a lot of calculations for inventor so it's you, it's not technically the file size at all times right it, it's how a part is modeled it definitely drives a lot of that um it's, yeah it's and, the complexity of the model itself and an example of that would be as you know, with the, the array within an array and array what happens is it has to compute at the lowest the, the lowest level array and then it's got to kind of propagate that to the next array and then got to go down to the next level so it's the model complexity and then you know that's where you get into you know sometimes if you if you get into another topic of uh, okay how do i improve in, uh performance of inventor on a large uh, assembly that's when you get into things like creating derived substitutes and things like that which is another topic but that's yeah. exactly yeah, and it also could be surfacing, right? A lot of uh, a thousand surfaces could, you know, definitely slow down inventor as well as opposed to having 10,000 cylinders or circles, right? Because the surfaces is there is no mathematical formula for a surface. So basically, inventor has to keep track of every point on the surface as opposed to for a circle, there's an equation of a circle that that's all really inventor needs to know. So and it's also obviously driven by um, the, your hard computer hardware as well. So a real tough to answer. Um, was versus iLogic. The question versus iLogic, I'm uh, not sure I understand. But we are up on the hour here. If you have any other questions, you can always email them to us. Um, actually, do we have a separate email for webcasts or how would they get questions after well, um, you can just e reply to that confirmation or reminder email you receive okay. from GoToWebinar. We can get th those come straight to us. We can get those to um, Dan or your or Bon or your sales rep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're up on the hour here. So I think uh, maybe we need to wrap this up. The one I know a lot of you have to get back to work. So. Okay, well, thanks, Bon, for the presentation. Thank you, Dan, for sitting in as well. And we thank you all for attending today. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everybody.